about seven years. Um, lieutenant in Chicago, uh, been with them about 19 years. Today uh, we're going to talk about some basic uh, fire ground company officer stuff. A lot of what we're going to talk about and deal with has a lot to do with uh, tactics. And as uh, all of us know, we can get 10, 10 guys together in a room and probably come up with 10 different ways that you're going to approach something. So what I'm going to ask for you to do today is a lot of participation. I don't want to listen to myself talk for two and a half hours, and I'm sure you don't want to hear that either. So please participate, be part of the class, uh, just not me up here talking. If you disagree with something that I say, again, we're talking about tactics. This isn't a perfect science on how we're going to do things if your department does something a little bit different than what I'm saying. Speak up on what you think is different, what should be done. If I say something you don't agree with, throw the both bullshit flag. Let's talk about it. Let's have a conversation. Don't leave her calling me an idiot. Call me an idiot here so we can talk about it, OK? Fair enough? All right. When we think about company officer and we think about decisions and the process of what we're going to do and how we're going to approach these things and um, the, the thought process when we're pulling up on the scene, we got to start doing this before we, we actually make that happen. We start in the morning when roll call happens. We start it when we're on the way to the call and we get the basic information that's coming up. <coughs> Regardless of if we're the new person on that apparatus or for that department or we're the senior guy on the rig, we all need to be thinking about what plans, what decisions, what process that we're going to do. Just because tomorrow they walk in and hand me the white shirt with a couple of extra bugles on it doesn't mean that I have all the answers. So we have to be constantly going through the process and the decision-making process of what we're going to do once we get to that fire scene. For us pulling up on the scene on this, First engine company on the scene. What's going to be the thought process? What's that, brother? Going up the stairs with the line. Going up the stairs with the line. Any stair, daytime. Um, what, are, what are your concerns? When I pull up on the scene, you brought up a taxpayer at daytime. What are my concerns right away? Occupancy. Occupancy. Where, where are my number one concerns with that occupancy? That second floor area, I'm worried about that heat and smoke traveling to that area. My second area of concern after I worry about that second floor, I'm worried about the third floor, where that heat and smoke is going for that area. When we talk about heading up that staircase, what is the time frame that we should be able to get a line in place to get water on the fire? From the time we pull up. From the time we pull up. And, and it actually, that, and that's what the concern is, and that's what we're realizing. Um, Oak Law, I'm sorry, not Oak Law, Orland Fire Department actually did basic runouts with, the, with their department. Um, they've got a good enough amount of people on their apparatus. They did uh, basic runouts, and they realized their times were closer to five minutes from leading out across it. When we think about a five minute time period, one of the big things, what, what they're talking about now with all the new studies, right? all the new studies that's out there, they talk a lot about flow path. They talk a lot about this transitional attack. How do we feel about that for this? You say yes, you say no. Talk to me, boss. Well, it's already venting, so I'd rather just uh, try to make a way up there and just push it right out. OK. And you guys, talk to me. You can probably get that from the outside. OK. And give me your thought process. Uh, Definitely a marginal attack. We're, we're probably going to empty the tank on that, or, or at least start darkening that down. Okay. And when we talk about doing it either way, and I, I think both ways work for what you're doing, but I think the important thing is what you're tactically capable of doing for your department. A two-man department leading out up the staircase and getting water on the fire soon, is that probably going to happen? Probably not going to happen. With the amount of people showing up at Cicero at the very beginning of a fire, are you guys going to be able to lead out pretty fast up a staircase with the amount of people you can throw at it? Absolutely, I, I agree. If we're going to do the transitional attack, we're going to talk about that in a little bit. There's a right way to do it. If I do a transitional attack and I do it wrong, I close that vent hole, which means that heat and smoke, where does it go? It goes right back inside that building. So if I do the transitional attack wrong, we know we can't push fire. All the studies, right, the new studies, 
with all the fancy computers, say you can't push fire. What kills civilians and firemen? Heat and smoke, right? That's what kills us. So if I do the transitional attack wrong, can I cause bad things to happen? Absolutely. If I do it correct, can I punch it in the mouth real fast? Absolutely, I can. If I lead out wrong, can I cause bad things to happen on the inside of that building, even though I'm trying to lead out up the staircase? Right, because I'm not getting water on the fire. So just understanding tactically what we're capable of doing and what our decision pro process is, is going to change what we're going to do. So when we talk about the responsibilities of that company officer, we're thinking about the decisions that we're going to make. We've got to understand what our weak points for that incident are going to be. If I show up as the truck company on the scene for Cicero, and my truck company is first on the scene, how much water do you have on your truck? 300 gallons. For this type of fire, depending on what lead out you're going to have, is it going to be a little bit more difficult if that engine company doesn't go on the, to show up on the scene for you to be able to do the things you're expected to do at that fire scene? If you're the engine company that shows up on the scene and you have a delay in that truck company showing up, how does it change what tactics are going to be done when ventilation is going to happen? That whole coordinated attack, again, they make it sound like that's one of those new ideas, how that's going to take place. If I ventilate at the wrong time, can I make bad things happen? Absolutely, I can. So things that we have to think about as the company officer. Vague or incomplete orders. People not understanding what is expected of them at that fire scene. When we talk about the orders that are being given, a lot of times they're done even without saying a word. If I work with my regular people on a regular basis, Everyone kind of understands when we pull up on the scene what our basic first couple tasks are going to be. From first engine, first truck, with uh, the whole, you guys use the blue card, with the whole blue card situation. You understand what your basic tactics are going to be at that incident for your first couple companies on the scene. So when we are, are possibly going to change those is when those orders are more important. Lack of initiative, waiting around too long for orders to happen not understanding what things need to be taken care of and what order they need to be done. Um, <coughs> undersized hose line. We're going to watch a couple videos in this, and that's something as a fire service around the country, we're pretty bad at. There are times when we need to pull that two and a half and we don't do it for multiple reasons. What are some of the reasons we don't pull that two and a half? Manpower. Manpower is a big part of what we're going to do. If we put the correct nozzle on that two and a half, though, and I'm able to hook up an inch and three quarters to that nozzle once I punch it in the mouth, that's probably a better choice than just pulling inch and three, pull, inch and three quarters and not getting the gallons per minute I need at the beginning of that fire. When we think about incidents that happen, by not putting enough <laughs> water on a fire at the beginning of an incident, let's think about ricks. When do ricks usually happen? We've had six of them in the last six months. They've all been within the, le the first 20 minutes of the incident, okay? So if we're not putting enough water on the fire at the very beginning of it, we can cause things to get worse on the interior of the building because we're, we're not putting the gallon per minute where it needs to be at the time that it needs to happen. <clears throat> lack of searches throughout the country just because of lack of manpower, it's probably one of the things that is thrown to the side when we're doing searches um, and how they're being done. A lot of times searches are missed till towards the end of the building just because of a lack of manpower for a lot of areas. Um, when we talk about doing searches, the skill level for the fire service, it is one of the areas that the studies that, that they're doing now, they're looking, it's something we're not very good at. One of the things that we've become um, uh, very lazy with doing is how we're doing searches. Most times when searches are being done, where are firefighters at? They're in a neat, uh, higher position than what they need to be. Um, I don't know about you, but for most fires that I've been to, I haven't seen many people floating <coughs> for me to be able to find them while I was doing the search. So if we're not down on the ground looking for them, it makes it difficult for us to do the searches properly and what we need to be. Another thing that comes in play with that is we've uh, seen a lot of uh, the tick cameras. <coughs> People not understanding how to use those tick cameras correctly. 
what the colors mean on them, what the numbers mean on them, and what, the, what are the areas we should be in doing searches, areas we shouldn't be in doing searches. For your guys' tips, what are you guys curious? Brand? Yeah, what brand? It's MSA. What do you guys have? M MSA also. Are they the, the ones that have colors and the number on the side? Yeah. Okay. For your cameras, do you know what the number on the side actually gives you a temperature of when that number reading on the side? When, if we're crawling down a hallway together and I take that camera and I point it at the ceiling, what is that number on the side giving me a temperature of? Right. So when I point it at that, when I point it at the ceiling, what's it giving me a temperature of? Surface temperature. Yeah. It, it, and that's what the big difference is going to be. I can have a ceiling at 500 degrees, but I can have that flow of heat above my head at 900 degrees. Which one scares me more? It's the, fl it's the flow, right? The, what that is, because that's where the flashover is going to come from. So a lot of times we get locked into what that temperature gauge says on the side. I don't really care a lot about that. What I care about is what those colors are going to show me. If I'm seeing those oranges and reds, my pucker factor needs to be a little bit tight because now I'm worried more about the flashover happening. If we're in an area, I don't have a camera. The camera's not working, the camera's broke. I'm on the pipe. Can I tell what the temperatures are above my head? If I take that nozzle and I shoot it at the ceiling and cold water comes down, I don't have to worry about those temperatures above my head. If I shoot it at the ceiling and steaming hot water comes down and hits me, where should my pucker factor be? It should be a lot tighter, right? If I shoot it at the ceiling and no water comes down. <laughs> All right? I, the pucker factor needs to be a lot tighter for that one. Okay? So we can, we can tell those things while we're working our way down the hallway with the equipment and tools that we have. When we talk about uh, opening up uh, windows and opening up holes, all that just needs to be done while we're coordinating it. Sometimes the hardest thing that we have as a truck company or a vent company is to be able to wait. And sometimes we have the A team on the truck company and the C team on the engine company. Happens sometimes. If I open up too soon, I can make bad things happen. If I go to the roof and I cut the hole, maybe I need to wait before I push it in. If I go to the rear of the building and I open the rear of the building, I do a quick search. Maybe I need to keep it closed for a while because they're having lead out issues. Maybe when I go to the front door to pop the front door for that engine company, maybe I pop the front door but I keep it closed till they're ready with that lock so I don't cause things to get worse for that engine. Um, updating tactics, not realizing what's happening around you, not paying attention to the signs that are going on and happening around you that what we're doing isn't working. Sometimes that's a difficult thing. Sometimes we get tunnel vision on what we're doing and we get lost in the process of not being able to change what we do. Um, anyone use PPV for initial interior tech? You want to watch some really bad incidents happen, go to YouTube. Watch some of the things that, that are on there of departments that have tried it, even drills or at fires, and how that has gone wrong. It's used throughout the country, and you go to your larger departments that use it, and they do a good job with it. I'm not saying it doesn't work. There's factors I don't like in using it. It does work. A lot of times departments will try it though, and bad things will happen because you're not following the basic rules with it. Positioning of apparatus, making sure that you always put your apparatus where it belongs for those incidents. Um, one of our firefighters who fell off of a fire escape that we lost in the line of duty downtown area. The reason why he went up the fire escape instead of going up the area ladder was because they went there for a fire alarm off to a business that they had gone to a hundred times before. When they got there, there was actually a fire in the kitchen area. He decided to save time he was, because they were trying to reposition the rig. He grabbed the extinguisher and he was carrying it up the fire escape. Made it up to the fire escape where it went from a regular fire escape to the ladder portion. He was trying to pull himself up, missed his hand, fell off. Okay? That tactically, when they look back on it, they didn't put the truck in the proper place. Why? Because they thought it was BS. If they were to position the truck in the proper place, do what they normally do at a working fire. 
that truck would have been in the right place, the ladder would have been to the roof. Uh, they took a shortcut. And sometimes when we take shortcuts, bad things happen. Um, deciding whether you're going to go interior or exterior. There are a lot of factors that have to play into that. Um, when you are able to throw more people at an incident, um, at the very beginning of it, it makes it easier to do an interior tech because you're able to accomplish those other tasks that need to be done while you're pulling that line in place. Making sure you have enough people who are pulling that line, putting it in position. Um, poorly positioned hose lines. Not leading out those lines correctly, not putting them in place, not taking the time at the very beginning of the incident to take your time, lead out that line correctly, and uh, make sure that you're not going to have the kinks of the problems with the doors that, that are going to happen in place. Um, Anyone ever hear of Andy Fredericks? If you're ever interested in uh, pulling some stuff up, he wrote a ton of articles for fire engineering, and he was probably the guru when it came to engine company operations. Uh, he was a New York fireman, had all his degrees, and he died, he died in 9-11. Uh, but they have classes out on the East Coast now uh, that memorize, uh, to memorialize uh, what he was able to accomplish and do at the time of his service. When he talks about leading out, he would say all the time, when you compare New York to Chicago, uh, Chicago will get up there before New York, but New York would get water on the fire faster because they would approach it like gentlemen. They would make sure the line was in a perfect position. They would make sure every door was chopped. They would make sure that everything was in place before that they went and did what they needed to do. And that's one of the things that we sometimes lose when we watch some of the YouTube videos that are out there. When people are leading out the lines, it doesn't look pretty. It doesn't look like they've done it before. Your 15 minutes of fame, it looks like spaghetti going everywhere. So lead out the line. Make sure that you've stretched it out and you're not just dropping it in a pile and expecting someone else to stretch it out for you. Can I, can I add something? Yeah, absolutely, brother. Aren't Go ahead. Are they saying that um, <clears throat> chalking the doors is something that might not be now with propath and all that, they're saying that, that changes, you know, more airway path, changing the conditions. There, with some of the studies that they're doing now with, with some of the, the NIST things, they're talking about keeping those doors closed um, a, as you move forward. Um, I haven't bought into that yet. I'm not a huge fan of going in, especially for your typical residential home, going in through that front door and someone closing it behind me. Um, I prefer to have that door open. Uh, my thing with that is, is if we're going to create the proper flow path, if we leave that front door open, what do I need on the other side of the house? I, right, I need a back door, I need a back window, I need something open, so I need a rear vent person. So now I, can, I have a flow path that I can change the direction. Mm -hmm. um, what can happen wrong is when people start throwing lines in through those other ways and you can change what the flow path is. Um, we, we can talk. We can talk a little bit about that, but uh, for for your departments, is anyone doing that as you're working that first line in? Are you closing those doors? I think just the front door is being left open, but everything else is not necessarily being left open. Yeah, yeah. And the, what what Andy was talking about was most of the buildings that going they're going into are the, like that building we saw, three, four, five story buildings. Where they're, where they're opening up five doors before they even get to the fire building. That, that, that's more of what he was talking about when he was talking about making sure that all those doors are chalked and, and left open so your line's not getting caught up. So when we talk about doing our size up, we need to understand um, that first thing in the morning, what position we're putting people in, what kind of day that those people are having. If I'm having a horrible day when, when we talk about what I'm going through, um, maybe I come in and I have a family member who's very sick. My head may not be in the game that day. Maybe I shouldn't be in one of those main positions being on the pipe. Maybe I should be in more of a filler position. Uh, maybe I shouldn't be driving the truck. Maybe I should be in one of those other spots. What equipment's out of service? Maybe one of the trucks or one of the engines is out of service. We have a spare sitting in its place. Maybe that spare rig we know is a little bit slower. The ladder takes a little longer to get in place. What type of things may happen in that type of situation? Um, any information that's going on? We went to this address three times. Last night they lit up garbage cans in the hallway in this place. 
it's something that we need to think about and worry about. If we hear that address, it could actually be going on the fourth or fifth time that we're going there. The weather, how the weather can change what is going on outside. It could take us longer to get to where we need to be. We could have fire hydrants we need to dig out. Maybe I'm gonna, the truck's gonna be a little bit more of a distance because of the piles of snow or where, how the cars are parked on that street because of the weather. Addresses, I know for the areas that I work in on a regular basis, we hear an address to go, yep, that's a good address for a fire. Those are regular places that we go to that we know we usually have working stills. Um, type of responses, what we're going to and what type of uh, uh, companies are coming to those incidents. It changes for us um, what size the building is, what the type of uh, um, response that we're going to get for those structures. For a high-rise building, we're going to get way more people uh, for a high-rise, even if it's just a basic first response call than it would be for a regular residential structure. When we're going to call those extra alarms, when we pull up on the scene sometimes, especially in uh, bad climate weathers, we want to call those extra alarms as soon as we get on the scene. It's better to get them in route and in staging than have to wait for them when we need them on the scene. When we talk about your radio reports, for your, your, your typical incidents, what information is going to be given and how it's going to be given. When you take what's being done with the blue card compared to what the uh, other side ups are usually done, they're given a little bit different, but a lot of that same information is, is being given. Try to keep it as brief as possible. Um, practice what you're going to say on a regular basis um, for the people who aren't used to talking on the radio as much. If you're going to be in that acting up position, um, make sure that you have enough under your belt that you've practiced enough so you, you sound like you've been there before and uh, you're capable of giving that correct information. Considerations like we talked about with the taxpayer that we saw up there earlier. We thought about what our life safety issues are right away. Those are going to be our concerns on how we're going to attack and how we're going to approach this fire. We're going to do those 360s. You're going to get an idea of what's going on in the, in the back of the building. Do we have how many floors are into the rear of the structure compared to the front of the building? Do we have a basement access to it? What is going on in the basement before I commit my companies to the first floor? Thinking of the bag method, where the fire's been, where it's at, and where it's going, how it's changing in that building. Looking at that fire behavior, reading the smoke and what it's telling me at that structure while we're walking up and deciding how we're going to attack this. For this building, it's a two and a half story frame. You got fire in the rear. S someone from Berwyn, give me the blue card method of doing a side, side up and a radio report when we pull up on the scene. All right, Central Throne 903. We got a one and a half story frame. Uh, we got smoke and fire showing from the Charlie sector. Uh, we'll be dropping our main bed. Cicero, uh, your, your normal report. Can someone give me a radio report, please? <laughs> Go ahead, Mark. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, uh, pretty much the same thing. I uh, have some frame. Well, I don't know if we say Charlie. We clear what's going in the rear. Okay. Uh, we don't typically don't follow blue card to the letter. Yeah. It's kind of our own blue card. We know all our buildings in town pretty much. We say what it's like. Everybody knows what the building is. We don't really get too specific with that. One and a half story frame, a fire showing in the rear, dropping the skid and going to the rear.
I mean, it, you'll you'll see in a lot of the videos that you pull up. That's one of the things that stands out a lot um, in, in what progresses and spires happen is the time delay that it takes to actually get water to the actual nozzle itself. And you look at the mess that, that he, he did even with the layout. All that time he was waiting for water. What should he have been doing with that Laying line? It out, right. Right. Yeah. Making sure it looked pretty so as soon as he got water, he was he was able to start working with it. We didn't have to worry about it. Th this fire it got into the eaves, yeah, which you can, like it, yeah. you can you can guess. And uh, while while they're going in there and do, doing interior, they started opening up and realized that they had fire rolling in the eaves. You can see the push out, out that yeah. eave there and out the second one. And again, he's still playing around outside. Tactically, as an officer, where do we need him? We need him inside the structure. We need a couple good truck guys open it up so he can start getting water in those void spaces for, for, for that incident. And I would guess that that lit up like that because you probably had two truck guys in there opening up. It gave it, it gave it the oxygen it needed, so, so that, that's why it lit up. Good truck guys working real hard. We don't have an engine company that's inside the building working with that truck. We, do, we keep talking about that coordinated attack, right? That fancy word, coordinated attack. That's not coordinated what's going on here. I don't know why anybody still hasn't put him inside that structure. Get about 12 pump cans in there, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So when we talk about what is going on with that, we had major internal exposure problems for that fire. It went to all three of those different roof levels for that building that we had in there. So we probably needed multiple lines inside that structure with multiple truck guys who were able to open it up so we can get into those void spaces. Giving that information over the radio, if you're in there and you open up a hole as a truck company and you have heavy fire in there, before we keep ripping down that ceiling, let's try and communicate that over the radio and get an engine company in there so you're doing that coordination with them. Understanding when, where, and what type of ventilation to do is an important part of how, how we do this. Um, when we think about uh, some of the times that we ventilate, a big portion of what happens with us as firefighters is understanding that time frame, understanding how long it takes us to get in position and making sure what we're doing is coordinated. <coughs> this is a video uh, from New York. Uh, I can't remember the truck officer's name, but they go around to the rear of the building. He's got a young kid with us. It's a one and a half story frame structure. Uh, there's fire on the C side of the building, uh, up on the second floor. What I want you to do is I want you to pay attention how many times that he asks if they have water and how long he waits before he actually takes this window up. Sounds not going through your speakers. Start <laughs> 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 
skip the sound part of it. We're just going to uh, see the video portion of it. I'll bring my speaker tomorrow. We'll be all good. Chris, can you just act out the word for us? Absolutely. Chris, go over there and just repeat give us, what you said. Give us some time. Chris, I put those, I put those light bulbs in it for Gary. Such a clown. You got He's with a young firefighter, and the firefighter's kind of masking up, and he's telling the, the young firefighter, now, you're not going into that window, so just relax and wait a minute. He keeps calling on the radio and asking if, if the engine has water. They're having water issues. Um, something happened with the pump on the rig. So he's up on the roof, and he's waiting before he takes the window. That he took the window, he heard the engine said they had water. He busted out the window. As soon as he busted out the window, you're going to see it lights up. He jumps on the radio and lets them know that there's fire on the second floor in sector three. Watch when it lights up. He jumps on the radio yeah, right now. Watch how fast it goes out. If he wouldn't have coordinated that, if he wouldn't have done it in that way, how much harder would he have made it for the engine company trying to work their way up the staircase? He'd have vented right away when he got up there. Understanding when that ventilation takes place is going to change the effects on how it, it, it has with that fire growing or if you're going to be able to just keep it under control. So understanding where and when to ventilate and what type of ventilation you're going to do. Every department's going to do it differently. Uh, some do just an exterior vent guide. Others go to the roof, depending on what your department does or for your area. is going to change how that ventilation takes place. Just make sure it's coordinated with the engine company. Um, your considerations for that company officer on the scene. Are we in rescue mode? Um, there was just not too long ago the anniversary of the Brian Carey incident. Um, for those of you who, who don't know that, you could always read the NIOSH Aligner Duty Death Report on that. 
But their uh, idea and concept, when they pulled up on the scene, they were told there was someone inside the structure. They went into rescue mode right away. They went interior to, to the building to start doing the rescue and start looking for the person who was in the building. Um, line advancement. Everyone's responsible for line advancement. Even if you're the truck company on the scene or the second engine, your first responsibility is to get that first line in place. If we can push that line further into the structure, to the, where the seat of the fire is, it's going to be easier for us to do the rest, rest of the jobs that we have to do. I can do searches easier. Ventilation becomes a little bit easier because we're actually getting water out of the fire. How much manpower do we have at the scene? How long is it going to take for me to get people into the areas that, that I need them to be in to be able to get the work accomplished and, and done? That's going to change what my tactics are. Uh, some of the places that we go and we do some of these classes, they're, uh, for a normal fire, they've got five, six, seven people on the scene for an incident. They may have a 20 minute response time. A lot of times for the things that they're showing up on, they're just cooling down the embers after the house has already burned to the ground because there's they such a delay in the response that they're having. Thinking about what you're going to do before you're gonna do it, communicating those actions, communicating not only what, what you're trying to accomplish at that fire scene, but also what things need to be done or what you're seeing at the scene. Um, different ideas of what needs to be accomplished. Uh, when we talk about the CAN reports, conditions, action, needs. One of the things that they said that they started that whole CAN idea was because as firefighters, when you ask if they need something, what do most firefighters say? No, we're good, we got it, we don't need anything. So it, instead of asking them what they need, um, giving them the ability to tell you before you're being asked makes them want to be able to say, yes, I do need a couple more people in here to help with this, as opposed to asking them if they need it. What are the possibilities and the probabilities of what actions need to be taken once you arrive on the scene? Even if you are in a staging area, sizing up the building, understanding where those companies are working, what is being done at this time, are they winning or losing? Pay attention to that building as you're uh, walking up to it. Understand if what we're doing is having a positive or negative effect on that structure. When we're talking about uh, given radio reports, as the companies that are working inside the structure, one thing that I recommend whenever we're doing radio reports is give them before they're asked. And the reason why is because when are we called to give a radio report? Right when we're in the middle of doing something. That's constantly when we get called. If I throw who's ever doing incident commander, that sector officer, a bone, um, it's when it's, I'm available to do it as opposed to when I'm trying to accomplish a task. So if I say something, it buys me some time, and it resets the clock in his head, as opposed to me waiting for him to ask, because then my first response is, fuck, I gotta stop what I'm doing, I gotta try to answer, I gotta say, hold on, we're in the middle of something. All right, take 10, and then we'll, uh, we'll go on with engine company stuff. Thank you. 
fifth by six months. Yeah, because uh, yeah. that's the only one I don't want because yeah. I, got something. Well, I, got, I, I got I got I was on the list. Yeah, yeah, right. Oh, okay. so you say I'm kind of did it. Yeah, that's ours. You're not gonna do it. Yeah. He goes, I, I've not ever put the tall stop. How about like for specific like TRT type of things? Um, they will pay for all your classes. You don't get any extra money. You don't get any extra money. You guys have all the apps. Trench collapse, confined space, and rope before you can even apply for something. You know Tom from Missouri? He's an outbound. You know, he was a medic for years ago when I first got hired. Where's he at now? He is floating around in uh, the first school. Is he with a squad? A squad. Yep. Where's the first station downtown? Uh, downtown in half of Mayfield. Okay. Yeah, we actually teach. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think I took a call. I took collapse tech at IMSI instructors. Yeah, I think he's in Arizona right now. Okay. I haven't talked to him yet. since since collapse tech. Long time, but I heard it. Yeah, him and I got promoted right around the same time. Yeah, it was in like two months. Yeah, like I said, there's probably. As I forgot, there's so many guys that were paramedics here in Cicero that went out of the city. Yeah, yeah. I guess some 20 or 30 guys that. Everyone needs somewhere to start. Right? Yeah. yeah. This is the only place I ever worked at. First test of all, I took Chicago in 95. Which one did you take? Is that the one you took in 95? I took it, I scored an 82. And I never got called. And I think I took I took Chicago and then this was my first suburban test I had. And I got hired here, so. It all worked out. It worked out. Chicago would have been cool, you know, but it's kind of nice. Cicero is right next door. It's busy. Sometimes. Sometimes. It's like anything I ever wanted to do. So uh, the whole so uh, 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 yeah, I guess if I got anywhere other than Chicago, it's a pretty good place. Yes. Yeah. Uh,
talk about uh, engine company operations. A lot has to do with how we're going to apply the water. Um, Ray McCormick does a pretty good speech where he talks about the amount of line of, line of duty deaths and injuries uh, that have happened where we have firefighters on the nozzle who have been injured or line of duty deaths. And what they attribute that to is the nozzle not being open. A lot of times when we look at the NIOSH reports and the line of duty deaths, you can pinpoint what truck companies do wrong. They can tell where that they uh, ventilated in the wrong place. They ventilated at the wrong time. They didn't do searches. They weren't in the right area. You can pinpoint a lot of times, but the problem that they have when they do a lot of these line of duty deaths and uh, the NIOSH reports is they will talk about engine companies and they will say, well, there's two lines in the building. Okay, well, that doesn't tell me anything. What nozzles did they have? Were the lines open? What gallons per minute were they flowing? Where were they in the building flowing water? Those are the things that matter. Just saying two lines in the building doesn't say what the engine company is doing. We've had uh, six RICs, uh, Mayday calls, in the last six months in Chicago. We've had six of them. And I will bet that probably five of them attributed to bad engine company work. If we open that nozzle and cool down the area, makes it easier for truck companies to be able to do work. Does it drop the smoke? Absolutely it does, it drops the smoke. But if I take away the heat, I can take away the flashover and the those type of incidents from happening, it makes a truck company easier to work. When I came on the job and we're, when some of the other guys who were sitting in this room came on the job, we were told with water, when's the only time we use it? When, right, when you see fire. And with the different products that are burning now, what we've learned is that we have to cool down that smoke. Because what's happening, that smoke is fully charged with products. It's fully charged with heat. When we show up and we open those doors, what do we give it? We give it the oxygen it needs. So we can cause those flashovers to happen um, while just us entering that structure. So if I can take that heat away, it's really the only thing I can take away until I get to the seat of the fire. I can work towards the where th that actual um, product is burned. But if I don't take away that heat, I can cause that flashover to happen. Understanding nozzle selection, whether it's an adjustable fog, how many gallons per minute that we're going to be flowing, um, how many kinks we have in the hose. One kink in the hose can take 50% of your water away from you at the minimum. So good line management, good line placement is going to be able to tell us how well we're going to be able to put water in the fire. Understanding the directions of travel um, for those incidents so we don't get apparatus that are going to be nose to nose or locked in. Uh, we're going to be able to drop into uh, where that company is, is working and feed them in case we have water issues. When we talk about um, companies working at the scene, 
what is the better plan? Is it better to take three lines off one engine, or is it better to have uh, three lines working off two different engines? And why is that, brother? It's hard, it's harder for, for one engine to put out the proper gallonage uh, to three lines sometimes, um, especially in zero. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and the amount of water that you're coming into that apparatus, what that apparatus is able to push out, ha has, has, it has a, a, a factor into that. One of the things that you have to worry about too, though, is if you have three lines going off of one apparatus and something happens to that apparatus, what just happened to every single person in that building? Nobody has no water. Nobody has water, so now everyone's in danger. If you have two c companies or three lines working off two different apparatus, you at least have water still working in that structure. Uh, making sure that while we're working as an engine company, we're talking to the truck company, we're doing that coordinated tick, we're working in opening up those void spaces, we're checking out what's going on in those areas. We try to have a line on each floor of the structure while we're checking out those areas. Um, Brian Scott, who used to teach the fire behavior classes uh, with me, he's now the chief of Evanston, uh, so he doesn't come out and teach that much. He tells a story about when he was a candidate. He was on one of their truck companies. They had a nice working fire, um, old Victor Victorian home. His officer sent him into one of the bedrooms and said, uh, open up the ceiling. I want the whole ceiling down. Brian was in there, his first fire he was on. His officer walked out, went to go do something else. Brian stuck his pipe pole into the uh, ceiling, stuck it in again, stuck it in a third time. He heard a whoa, whoo, and the entire ceiling fell. Had a small little smoke explosion that happened when he let the oxygen come in. His officer came running in there, saw the entire ceiling was down, said, Good job, kid. <laughs> they went and did something else. Brian said he didn't realize until years later that it was a smoke explosion, but something small like that, not having a line up there, could cause an effect of what happened in that incident. You had a good truck company working, they didn't have a line up there protecting them while they were doing the basic overhaul that was going on. So your basic forward or uh, reverse lead outs, we're not gonna get into uh, huge amounts of what that is and, and where that's from. Understanding that the closer that pumper is to that hydrant, the better volume of water you're gonna be able to get into that apparatus. It could be though the longer you have to wait to actually get water into the line. You're not gonna be able to do quick water with your cross lays because you're gonna have to wait for that apparatus to drive down uh, the street. Uh, so just understanding that and knowing that for the incident is, is going to be beneficial for you. We talked a little bit um, about earlier about that transitional attack. And uh, we, we showed one incident. We, we talked about what um, some people said, yeah, that would be one of those incidents that it would use it. Some people said, what would be? For the guys that said for the incident, that would be one that you would use it. When would be a time you wouldn't use transitional tech? What's that? Rescue. 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 People, people inside. And what's your definition of people inside? Savable people inside. Okay. People who are still alive, or that, or that, you, that you can assume are still alive, depending on how the fire is. And when, when we look at those type of incidents, when we think about what we call salvageable, we take your basic house. As you see, I'm not an art major, so don't yell at me. I thought you were trying to punk him for a second. <laughs> punk your eyes. It looks like it, don't it?
This is basically my house. Upstairs, bedroom one is on the entire one side of it. Bathroom in the middle, bedroom two in the back, bedroom three in the front. So this would be bedroom three, right? If I have heavy fire coming out of this window here, and I have someone back here in this bedroom, is that a salvageable, per salvageable person? Yes. 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 If I have someone in this room, is that a salvageable person? Probably not, right. If I got heavy fire blowing out of that window, am I still going to search that room? Yeah. Yes. Once we hit that fire, absolutely. I'm going to get in there and I'm going to search that room. And that's what we talk about with calculated risks. All right. That's what we talk about calculating what, what's going on in there. Did I completely write that room off? No, I didn't write it off. It's going to change my tactics for that room. If I have someone back in this bedroom, are we okay with doing a transitional attack for this room? Who says yes, who says no? Yeah. What do you got, brother? Say it. I say yeah. What do you say? I say no, because we got multiple ways to close that off. I don't think it should make the condition that bad in that room. That when you talk about closing it off, talk to me. What do you mean? Well, it's somewhat isolated from where that bedroom is. You got the stairs, the bathroom, and multiple walls blocking that area. Outside, it shouldn't affect the conditions that much in that room if there's a person salvage going there. If you were going to hit from the outside, how would you do it? Straight stream, straight up to the yeah. wall, not moving it around. Right. Just cool that room off, change conditions in that room, and then make your way up that stairwell. And the tactics you just talked about is what we miss a lot for transitional tech. The, the things he just talked about, he talked about hitting it off, off the ceiling. He talked about not moving it. As a firefighter, how many times have you ever been told not to move the line? What have you been told your entire career with the line? What is the most difficult thing to, to not want to do now? Everything you've been taught in your career is move that line around. For transitional tech, you're not supposed to move it, because if I move it, what did I just do to the window? I've, I've closed it off, so now everything that was coming out of the bottom of that window, I closed it off, now it has to go somewhere. Point of least resistance, where's the point of least resistance now? Out that doorway, into that hallway, into those other rooms. When we talk about the angle that we're supposed to put the transitional tech in, I'm going to throw a video on. Um, uh, no, I can't because we don't have sound. Uh, I think Eric probably just go all the way up with your your iPad there. Um, well, uh, next break, I'll see if I can. Uh, if if, if I, I I don't need my speaker with me, I'll see if I, I can mess with that again to be able to do it. But we'll watch a video on, on transitional tech. If for some reason we can't watch it today, it's by LA County. It's on YouTube. It's probably the best video out there that explains how to do transitional attack correctly. Um, it, it, it's about 20 minutes long. It, it goes through the process of being able to explain what the proper uh, angle is supposed to be, what the proper amount of water you're supposed to put into the room, how much time that you should do it. Um, it, it, it goes through that, that whole process of it. Um, so when we talk about transitional attack, uh, th th there's ways to do it. You can do it with an inch and three quarter hand line. You can do it with a two and a half. You can do it with a deck gun. You just have to be able to be controlled with it. If we do it with the deck gun, what's my concern? Blowing through all my water before I even get it into the window. Um, so we go out and we do hand on classes with doing it with the deck gun. But we make sure we tell people if it's not something you're going to practice, doing it at 2 o'clock in the morning for the first time is not your 15 minutes of fame you want to be on YouTube. Because you're going to throw 500 gallons of water over the house. For an engine company, the tools that we have with us, the things we carry in our pockets, um, most firefighters are extremists. They either have absolutely nothing in their pockets, or they're like Batman and they have 9,000 things that are falling out of their pockets on a regular basis. Okay, so we need to understand the tools that we're going to use on a regular basis. If we work with the same people, if I carry different things than you have, it makes us a little bit lighter and a little bit more beneficial to what we're going to be able to accomplish and do in the building. 
I would recommend that everyone has uh, door chalks in their pockets, at least two or three, and everyone have multiple lights on them. I carry three lights on a regular basis. I carry the big lantern. I carry one like that in my coat, and I have one on my helmet. The one on my helmet is strictly to let me know if we're winning or losing. I turn it on before we go in the building. It should be bouncing off stuff as we're putting water on the incident or the smoke gets real thick, I'm gonna lose the light and I'm not gonna be able to see it. As we start winning and everything starts lifting, I'm gonna start seeing that light bounce off things again and that's gonna tell me that we're having a positive impact on it. Think about how much water we're gonna need at the incident. Think about how well we're gonna be able to work with those lines that we have. We think of the speed and the gallons per minute. Um, for, uh, when I came into fire service, one thing they said about choosing your lines was big fire, big water, right? Um, I brought up a little bit earlier about the Brian Carey incident. Does anyone know anyone from that incident? Has, have you guys heard about that incident at all in the past? Sure. One of the things that they talked about with, with those guys, and I think they took an unfair beating in about 100 different ways for that fire, but one of the things that they talked about was they had about a 1,700 square foot um, ranch style home, and they pulled a two and a half inch line. For that incident, they took an interior, interior to the building. Now, a lot of people after that incident was over said, what were they doing with a two and a half inch line on the inside of that structure? The small seven, 800 square foot home. If those guys would have died with an inch and three quarters in the hand, what would people have said? Why did they have a bigger hole? Why did they, right, exactly. So either way, they would have been in, in the wrong for that. The only thing that I can say is one thing that I did learn from that incident with a two and a half inch line, one thing that I practiced afterwards was with an inch and three quarter hand line, they probably would have been able to back that line out, charged, to be able to protect themselves. Brian, when he was in that incident, chose to shut down that line, try to make it 12 feet to the door. He didn't make it in a flash. Think about in your career, how many times have you backed out a two and a half inch line charged? Before Brian died, I can tell you I had never done it. Okay, so if we're going to choose a two and a half inch line, and the two and a half inch line is appropriate sometimes, but Backing out a two and a half inch line while it's charged is also a skill. And it, um, when it's eight, 900 degrees in a room, that's not gonna be the time that I wanna try for the first time backing out a two and a half inch line. So it's something to add to your skill level. Again, this is one of those incidents that we are using way too small of a line for the amount of fire that we have different choices that we, we need master streams here. We need uh, the ability to have two and a half inch lines being able to put water on the fire. This is different than if it would be an ordinary uh, a frame structure. If we had a frame structure here, I would have to worry about that actual building burning itself. With the brick style home that we have here, I have contents and walls burning. I, I don't have to worry about that structure going anywhere. It buys me time to be able to get in there and get, get working for this incident. Figuring out how much hose you're going to need on a regular basis for the houses that you're gonna show up in. For our still districts that we respond to, realistically we have probably about 10 different style homes that we're gonna see on a regular basis. Um, one thing that we can do that's a really fast and easy drill to be able, when we show up to houses for gas leaks, we show up the houses to assist the ambulance um, uh, for whatever that we're going to. As we're going back to the rig, make sure we put the rig in the proper place. If I go to the hardware store and pick up two clips and 200 feet of string, that's something I can keep wrapped around a stick. I can hook it to the rig. I can pull it into the house, see how long, far that line reaches, and then I can roll it back up. And even if we get a call and I gotta disconnect from the rig, I throw it to the side. What did I spend? Four dollars? But it's an easy way to do a quick drill with the people that, that are coming on that are new um, or that just deciding how much hose that we're going to need to be able to reach for that area and the distances that we're going to have to get to. There are different ways that we can estimate how much hose that we're going to need. Um, there's a different way that we can estimate how many gallons per minute that we're going to need. We're not going to get into uh, that a lot. All we're going to say is understand what you have on your rig and how far it's going to be able to reach depending on where that you're going to be parked. <laughs> the 
when we think about this store that they're in, it's a hardware store. The amount of fire load that we have on the first floor of this structure, does he have the proper line? A couple two and a half in the front of the building as opposed to one inch and three quarter would probably be a better choice. Thinking about where we're putting our firefighters in the front of this structure, that sign that's hanging there in front of the building, uh, depending on how much fire load that we have in the structure, depending on how that's connected, that could be a fall hazard and where we want to protect where we're putting our firefighters. the end result. I'm guessing they lost this building. So again, we talk about effective lead outs. We have to make sure that we're stretching out that line correctly. For your typical residential structure, even your business, sometimes we need to walk past that structure and then back <laughs> forward so that line is stretched out. Sometimes we can walk to the other side of the street, depending on where the truck is, and lead it back towards the front of the house, just so that line is let out and there's not a lot of kinks in it. Um, when we're moving through the structure, um, try not to have uh, tools jammed into your belts it's more of a fall hazard and a tripping hazard. Um, and carry them with you. As you're an engine company, you can always jam them into a corner as you're working through the structure and come back for them if you need them. Again, making sure that that hose is, is being let out correctly. Don't take too much to the front door and drop it in front of the front door. Um, it's going to make things more difficult, especially if they decide to charge it before you're ready for it. Um, don't put yourself in a position where uh, you're going to have that issue. When we talk about truck company operations, what, things that we need to think about while we're uh, doing those rescue or truck company operations, first of all, is going to be who do we need to rescue first? How do we decide which people are in the most danger? Sometimes it's not always the person who is closest to the fire. You could have three or four people hanging out a window, and you could have someone who's closer to the incident or closer to the fire, and you may have to rescue someone else first because that's going to be your jumper. That's going to be the person who's going to uh, decide that they're in the most need and jump out the window first. So that's the person you want to go to first. As you're deciding who's going to be rescued first, you want to make sure that you're talking and communicate to the other people who you're going to next, what you want them to do. If you raise the ladder directly to them, they're going to jump out to the ladder and possibly knock you over or fall down the ladder. Try to roll the ladder into where they are and don't drop it right into them. 
Think about what your entry points are going to be for the structure. What needs to be open? Do fences uh, and gates need to be moved? When we go to the rears of the structure, especially for commercial building, what are some of the concerns that I have with going to the rear of a commercial building? Any answers? Forceful, forceful entry issue, what changes? Well, the doors are way more, they're heavier doors, they're usually steel doors, and they're just you know, super protected. So what are, the, what are the tools that I probably want to think about bringing to the rear of the structure of a commercial building? K-12. K-12 is a good idea. Do we have a rabbit tool or some type of hydro ram? For those type of doors, most of them swing outward. So you may not be able to push that door inward, but what can I do with the hydro ram or rabbit tool? I can improve my gap and make it easier for me to get a different tool in there that I'm going to be able to work on that door. Do you have any of the uh, hydraulics, either the Hearst tools or a Genesis that run on batteries? You can take those right to the rear of the structure. It makes it easier to uh, improve your gaps and pop those doors in the rear of the buildings. When we talk about uh, working as a truck company, a lot of times with your truck companies, you send a couple people uh, for the people who do go to the roof, a couple people to the roof, and a couple people to the interior. Uh, of the building. When you're working on the, the roof, you want to make sure you're giving an idea of what's happening um, on that roof as you're doing. If it's a commercial building, where are the uh, air conditioning units? What's going on in that flat roof? Is it bubbling? The areas that it's bubbling? Do we have any sagging for those uh, peaked roofs? When you're working on the structure, do you have fire in the void space? What type of smoke conditions do you have going on? Can you get a look at the uh, seaside or the rear of the building to tell you what's happening and what's going on there? At 15, you're being requested for the patient with breathing problems, 1611 South Cicero Avenue, F15. You're being requested for this. Constantly checking up with the other members of the truck company, getting um, uh, information on where they're working and what's going on and what the next avenue that they're going to be taking and what they're going to be doing is. Um, what's going to be accomplished and what are the priorities for that company. engine company operations for pulling up on the scene as first engine, what would we be doing for that incident? Exposure. Worried about that exposure building. What are some of my major concerns with that exposure building compared to the building that's on fire? Right, it's a framed building. You, 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 I got to worry about the entire structure going up too. How would we feel about getting a two and a half going um, for inside that window and on that frame building itself right away while we're leading out into the structure? How many people do we need to man that two and a half on the outside of the structure? One. Right, one person sitting on that two and a half. We got an inch and three quarter hand line there that's barely reaching uh, to where the fire is. It looks like no gallons per minute and no pressure.
wasted? I don't understand what he did with that deck on there. He put it so it's hitting the building. Yeah, he's, right. he's not in the window and he's not on the exposure. Right. He's just hitting the building. And he's not even up there manning it. So and now it's shooting over, over the structure. Maybe he wanted to get more pressure. Yeah. 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 Teach the the deck on, uh, area for that the hand on portion that we do. One of the things we recommend. You saw he uh, climbed up there. He got it going. He didn't have enough pressure, so he just kind of had to hit the building. He had to climb down. He had to turn up the pressure. He had to crawl back up there. If you put a shut off valve up there, you can at the engineer's point. You can crank it up to where you need to be. You can then go there. You can position it where you want it. You open up the shut off valve. Throw your 10, 15, 20 seconds of water. They were actually working their while, but if you were using it in that way, you can then shut it, climb down, and you can you can you can crank it down to, to where it needs to be. But that way you can control it all from up top, and you don't have to worry about climbing up and down um, for positioning of, of it. The other thing that you can do, depending on your tall buildings, we were just out in Franklin Park. They have a. Uh, they have, they have an eight-story um, senior living building uh, <laughs> in, in, in there. And we were able to, by uh, extending and putting uh, two straighteners on there, we were able to hit the top floor of, of that, that building by putting two straighteners on there. Um, for them, because they have a limited amount of manpower, they have two, two three-man companies showing up on the scene, it's a way for them to uh, put water on the fire uh, from the from the ground floor even before they enter the building um, to be able to reset it uh, for for them as they're working their way up with with their lines think about where you're positioning your your ladder placement uh, for all the calls if you go on again we should be putting that ladder on the scene where that we're going to put it if it, the building was actually on fire what's going to be the easiest way what are some of the hurdles you're going to run into um, trees that are going to be in the way, power lines, um, street lights that are going to change where that apparatus is going to be placed um, for that incident. Think about all the responsibilities that we have as a truck company or a rescue company showing up on the scene. Um, ladders that are going to be put in place. Once we put ladders to a window to a building, they should be announced. They should not be moved from that area. Overhaul, opening up uh, those areas and those void spaces to seeing what um, where that fire has gone and what type of areas that we need to uh, push further in and get those those holes opened up. Where we're going to ventilate, are we going to do it horizontally, are we going to do it vertically? What positive and negative effects are we having on those companies working in the building? What needs to be forced to make everything easier for everyone working on the scene? Is it just exterior stuff or do are there areas inside the building that are going to need to be forced? Who's going to be rescued? How that re rescue is going to help ha happen? Salvage, what can we save for the people that we're going into? Um, what can we cover up or make sure that we're not going to make things um, and cause them to lose everything for this type of incident? And are we going to get the utility shut off? And uh, who's going to do that? And how soon in the incident are we going to be able to accomplish that? Yeah. 
As soon as we show up on the scene as a truck company or a rescue company, we want to do a basic re recon, see what our priorities are going to be and what we're going to put in line first, what's going to be in place. Um, the, for the windows and this, uh, secondary means of egress, do we need ladders in those areas? Is just opening them up and letting ventilation happen going to be the easiest way to do it? With the windows that are in place nowadays, <coughs> the thermal pane windows, uh, years ago you used to just be able to take your helmet and break the glass out, it was no big deal. Now you take your helmet and all you're doing is bending the eagle on your helmet when you hit the glass with it. Uh, it's a little bit more difficult to do it. The uh, center uh, column for the windows, uh, for the sash itself, is they're very difficult to break out. Some of those windows it's easier just to pop out of place than try to break them. Um, also makes a lot less of a mess if we take them out and put them to the side as opposed to trying to break them out. Um, when we're searching for people, make sure we're doing complete searches in that area. Um, when we do a primary search, primary searches for those basic rooms should take about 90 seconds. When we're going back and we're doing the secondary, that's where we're moving beds and we're checking in and around things. We're going all over and, and actually moving the materials. As we're going through the structures and we're doing searches, a lot of times as firefighters, as we start doing a search, when we come across a chair and we're doing a search, what do we do with that chair? We throw it across the room to the other side of the room. So as we're doing our search, we get to the other side of the room, what do we got to do? We got to throw the chair back again to be able to finish our search. Right? We do it on a regular basis. As you come across stuff, try and leave it where it is, search around it, search underneath it, search behind it. When you come across a chair, one of the things that I was taught um, when I first uh, got in the fire department when we were doing searches, every time you come across a chair, turn a chair towards the doorway you came in. If you always do that, every time you come, into, come to a chair, if you get disoriented, disorientated in a building, if you come to a chair, you know which way is the way out. Um, checking for partitions in a building. Think about the structures that you're going to be going into. Think about the things that have been done to the houses or the buildings that are 100 years old that you're going to be going into that have had legal changes to that structure's done. Now think of the amount of changes that have happened to those structures that have been done without permits. Okay? There's lots of void spaces that have been created, basements that have been cut up into being, instead of one large room, seven small rooms. That changes how that fire load's going to take place and what's going to happen in that structure. When we talk about um, keeping accountability of your crew, when we're doing those uh, check-ins with our company to make sure people are doing what they're doing, what is the plan in place if a PAR is called? Where are you going to meet if the building is evacuated? Um, what is the plan on how we're going to be able to get together and to be able to do that, that uh, PAR? We're not going to do this video because we don't have the sound. As the company officer and as the members working underneath that company officer, understand that they can't be everywhere, so we need to fill them in with the information that we're coming across as we're doing things. Try and be as specific as possible with the information you have. Don't just talk on the radio to talk on the radio. Have a decision of what's going to be said before you press the push the talk button, give them as the little information that you have for them, and uh, move on to that next part of the incident. Understanding when conditions change. If you're going through the second floor and you're doing a search, and the smoke goes from the level where you're able to walk through it to where you're down on your knees now crawling through that incident, that's conditions change that you need to be able to communicate to people. The, that the conditions have gotten worse up on the second floor. Start thinking what other things you're gonna need up there. Maybe you will need ventilation up there. Maybe you need a line up there before you can ventilate. There's a uh, video that's out there of a New York firefighter who um, was on fire and fell onto an aerial ladder um, to, cr to crawl down the rest of the, the way down the aerial ladder. And what happened was he was up on the second floor of a residential home the line went towards the rear of the building to search for where the fire was. He went towards the front bedroom to do a search. When he got into the front bedroom, the line had not made it to the seat of the fire yet. The room was intensely hot. 
when the room wasn't hot as a truck company, he thought the line was working towards the fire, so what did he do? He ventilated. Not a crazy idea, it's something we've probably all done a hundred times. What happened though was they had not made it to the seat of the fire. The temperatures were hot enough in that room. The room flashed while he was in the room. Um, there, there were three small windows in the front. When it flashed, he tried pushing himself out the window. He didn't even know the ladder was there um, when he fell onto the ladder. Because what happened, do you think, is to his uh, face piece right away? It, it, it melted and, 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 and cracked over right away so he couldn't even see. He fell on, onto the ladder. Um, again, this is something he had probably done a hundred times before where he vented the room. The temperatures were just hot enough where the, the line had not made to the seat of the fire to start cooling things down when he vented. When we're talking about where we're going to position our, our uh, vehicle, understanding what direction um, um, that the fire is moving is going to help depend on where we're going to ventilate and where we should start our ventilation. Um, understanding what our exposures are, what exposures we need to get to first. Again, it doesn't have to be exposures on the outside of the building, it can be exposures on the inside of the building. Other bedrooms that we can close doors and prevent things from getting worse. And, Look at your obstructions that you're going to come in as you're putting the in, placing that apparatus. You may need to pull it up. The engine may need to pull a little bit further, depending on what's in front of that structure. You may not be able to use the cross legs. You may need to have to go off the rear. Um, look at accessibility. Some of the buildings we're going to go to, there's a, a longer setback where you may not be able to use the aerial. You may have to just use ground ladders to be able to reach to where you need to be. Heavy push of the, that gray smoke coming out of the uh, chimney area. It looks like we're ventilating. We haven't gotten any water to the seat of the fire yet. Understanding conditions, they just lost the roof. Luckily, when they lost that section of the roof where they were at, there wasn't fire that came through it because the amount of time that they spent hanging there. your ventilation, why do we ventilate? Well, hopefully when we ventilate, it's to kind of lift that smoke, to make it easier for us to give a, a little bit of air for the civilians to be able to breathe, to make
think firefighters searches for them a little bit easier. Again, we have to do that coordinated with that engine company. If we ventilate too soon, we actually can make conditions worse in the incident. Um, there's a lot of information that we have out now that it talks about um, air limited fires. And when we have air limited fires, it changes what happens in the structure. When uh, Chicago did the power move and took over areas of Bensonville when they wanted to extend the, the airport, NIST and UL came out and did a couple uh, fires out there to do a study. And what had happened a handful of times in New York is you had good aggressive truck companies that didn't have fire showing, they just had smoke. They would pop the front door, they would go into the second floor, they would do searches. They would get up to the second floor and by the time a minute and a half, two minutes rolled around, they had heavy fire up on the second floor and they were jumping out of windows. There were a couple injuries and I think even a line of duty death that happened um, from the incident. So they decided we're gonna go out and we're gonna do some of these studies. This is actually a town home. You're gonna see a firefighter stick his head out the window here. There's a wall here because it's a second building. All this aluminum foil on the front of the structure is just for the sensors. Has anyone ever seen this one before? Pulled up on the scene now, what would we guess is going on? Light smoke, light smoke. Light smoke, second floor, so what would you think? Bedroom fire, something burning in the bedroom, probably contents, that's what I would think also. smoke on the second floor, I probably wouldn't change my opinion. I probably still think it's a second floor fire, probably a mattress or something burning at this point, probably leading out a line. Are we seeing the smoke from around the door? You think if it was two o'clock in the morning, you'd see that smoke, or if the door was a different color? If the door was a darker color, you're definitely not seeing that smoke around the door. Heavy push out that second floor window. Thick black smoke, lots of volume. Now that's it. That was at 3:30 that you had all that volume of smoke. You pull up at the scene now. What's your size of? Yeah, nothing showing, right? I mean, you have no smoke. You you have no fire. You have nothing going on. Watch the way conditions change. As soon as he pops that door, what happens to that second floor window? seeing the fire on the first floor now. For this incident, all they did was they took a couch and put it at the bottom of the staircase and lit it on fire. And that second floor bedroom was nothing. All it was was the flow path. For, and what happened on the first floor, it was uh, one of the, those foam couches. 
the entire first floor filled with that thick black smoke so it had no oxygen. So that's why as soon as he opened that front door, you saw that huge release from the second floor. There was a second bedroom up on the uh, second floor um, that they kept the door closed and temperatures didn't reach over 110 degrees in that room. They were able to keep them low. Uh, for that other second floor bedroom, they were flash over temperatures, close to. So w when we think about what we see at the scene, we can sometimes be tricked with, again, by that fancy word, that flow path, and where that fire actually is and what is going on. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. What was the point of the fireman in the other window? Just to see if it... Uh, it just it's make sure it didn't extend into the other building because they wanted to do a couple more fires. So he was just there babysitting. But uh, a couple times when we've done this class, someone said, what's that fireman doing up there? So uh, that's why I say it at the very beginning. Yeah. So when we, when we ventilate, we're trying to prevent that smoke from building up in, in the house for mushrooming down and start to uh, build those layers into that structure where we're gonna have those flashovers. If we can release some of that smoke, hopefully we can prevent flashover from happening because we're working our way to the seat of the fire. Um, think about what we're going to be doing on the roof, how long we're gonna be up there, what tools are gonna be necessary for it to be up there, what saws we're gonna take, um, what's gonna make that job the easiest to be up there. Um, think about if we don't belong up on the roof because conditions are that bad, we probably don't belong underneath it either. I'm going to talk about tool assignments because you have your own. Um, for your uh, blue card uh, terminology, when we think about how we're going to be giving our uh, size ups, uh, they, they give the shops method. And you're talking about the size of the building. That, the, the size is kind of determined about how much hose that you're going to need to be able to reach the uh, seat of the fire. You have your small, medium, large, and your mega would be like your Home Depots and things like that how many stories you have of that structure. Um, depending on what you're showing up at and how you call things in your area is gonna depend on how many stories you have. Uh, for us, when you have a, a peaked roof, it, it's a two and a half story or one and a half story frame. Some people will just automatically call it a three story. When you have some of your buildings in your town, um, do you call them garden apartments? Do you call them basements? What level? below grade constituted being a basement apartment or a garden apartment as opposed to the first, first floor. It matters in incidents. There was a couple incidents that happened where um, some people called it a garden apartment, some people called it a first floor. And if he's on the second floor and calls for a mayday, and I'm considering it the third floor because of what I'm calling the basement or garden apartment, I'm gonna go search for him in the wrong place. Doesn't matter what you call it, just make sure we're all speaking the same language when we're talking about stuff like that. What's the occupancy? Changes what tactics may be done for that incident. Res residential, multifamily, um, how that building was put together. Your commercial buildings, your strip malls, industrial, your big box. Um, for your strip malls, when we think about being able to fight those type of fires, really those are content fires. They're buildings that are gonna fall apart pretty easy. They're usually steel bar trusses for those type of structures. And if we put a two and a half inch line on the sidewalk, I can basically hit the back of the building uh, from where I'm at with a two and a half inch line. So we usually don't have a lot of life safety issue for those type of buildings. What are we seeing when we pull up on the scene? Uh, smoke showing where the fire's at and what type of operations we're doing. Uh, for the blue card section, they, they talk about being offensive or defensive for the incident. Who is assuming command? For your towns and your communities that you respond to. Um, I know for Cicero, you have a chief responding right away. For Berwyn, do you guys have a chief coming right away? Does anyone wait outside the structure um, till the chief gets there? Or do your crew goes and uh, stays together in all interior? They're trying to push, there's a big push in the fire service to get away from that. There are a lot of communities that still do that. They leave their senior guy outside to run command. And when you think about, uh, we talked about writs and maydays happening, where should your senior guy be? Inside running his, running his company and not outside the structure. Um, a running command where, where it, the best place for him to be is to be in with his interior crew. 
your types of staging, your level one staging. Um, your level one staging is within a block of the incident. You're close enough where you're going to be able to put to work right away. And your uh, level two staging is they want you a minimum of two blocks away. That's going to be for your full alarm, full still alarms or graders for your companies that are responding to the scene um, that are going to be assisting, but they're out of the way while the crews are working. On deck, I think there's positives to the on decks and there's negatives to the on decks. I think it's great to have on decks on each side of the building. It gives you a way to have a RIT crew ready to go um, to be able to start working for those type of incidents. One thing I don't like about the on deck is it changes what you're watching. So if he was sitting and he was on deck and he went interior and now I'm on deck and I'm sent into RIT, RIT maybe I don't know what, I, what they've already seen. The incident could have changed, it could have gotten better, it could have gotten worse. Maybe I don't know where all those companies are working. I think there's positives and negatives to the, to the on deck. When we talk about recycle or rehab, recycle is basically you're going out, you're changing your bottle, getting some water, you're going back to work as, as soon as possible. Rehab is you're going to be taking some time and you're going to be rehydrating and uh, taking a breather. Understanding your tactical uh, uh, benchmarks, uh, understanding what your all clear is. That means your search is, is done for those areas. Your fire control, you're checking those areas, you're making sure that there's uh, um, that those areas are clear of any fire or any extension in those areas. Um, what type of salvage operations you can do for your loss and for your customer stability. What have you relocated? Where are you putting these, these people to be able to get the help they need after the incident is going on? <coughs> your classifications of floors we don't need to do. Your size of your, your buildings. Some people are still using the one, two, three, four. There's a huge push to be able to use the A, B, C, D, or the Alpha Bravo Charlie Delta, as opposed to using the number system anymore. Your task is what your assignment is going to be. Is it going to be offensive or defensive? Um, where you're going to be positioning at in the crew, whether you're inside the building on the second floor or you're outside the building on the C side of the building, what the objective of your function is going to be for that incident. For your unit, um, for your conditions, actions, and needs. Again, we talked about that a little bit earlier. Um, they put it in that order so things aren't uh, being missed. What company is working? What are you seeing in that area? You've got heavy smoke, no heat um, up on the second floor. What actions you're taking? You're opening up windows on the CD side of the building. And I could use an engine company up here with an inch three quarter hand line to be able to uh, assist us in opening up the void spaces. For your PARs, um, again, we need to have a decision on where we're going to meet if a PAR needs to be done on the exterior of the building or if we're together on the interior of the building and we're still working. Um, when we are given a PAR, sometimes they prefer right after you give a pan that your or your can your, that your company is PAR. Other times where your PAR is going to be asked for. PARs is uh, no PAR, PAR, or PAR in progress. Par in progress means you're working on getting your par, you're trying to locate the rest of your company. No par means a mayday is going to be called, and par means that you're, you have everyone with you and everyone's accountable for. When we talk about evacuation or abandonment, evacuation is a slow, steady removal of our companies inside the building. The people who are furthest away from the exteriors are going to be the ones that exit first. If I'm working a line on the first floor and I have a truck company working up on the second floor, that first floor company does not leave until that second floor companies are out of the building because they are their protection. Abandonment means you're exiting the building right away. Neither of these are done most of the times for a writ. Once they're put in place, when a May Day is called, we don't evacuate the building. We keep working to be able to protect the people that are inside the structure, working trying to get our firefighters out. We missed a couple videos just because we don't have sound. I'm sure none of you are going to complain about that. Um, questions or comments before we go? Please fill out the evaluations. I hope you got something out of it. And enjoy your lunch. Oh, what was that?
K-R-A-F-T. I didn't, I didn't want to tell you. <laughs> 